It is tempting to think that more leadership or some kind of improved leadership will help us and our organizations work better. But what if leadership was part of the problem instead of the solution? What if our understanding of it only maintained principles of the past, which no longer serve us well? That's what I explore in my book, Dare to Unlead, and today in this podcast. Join me and my guest, a person quoted in the book or in tune with its values, to learn from them what it takes to unlead and succeed together. Welcome to the 11th episode of the Dare to Unlead podcast, where we wrap up a series of conversations about important topics covered in Dare to Unlead, the book. From a long experience in the corporate world, I came to realize that leadership is broken. It doesn't serve human needs nor business needs very well. And for more than a decade on the field, I have been uh, experimenting with different ways to achieve collective performance. That's what, re that's what is reflected in the book along the three values of liberty, equality and fraternity. And in the follow up conversations in this podcast with people I'm inspired by. You may recall that the first conversation in episode one was with my mentor and friend Myron Rogers, who also wrote a beautiful foreword for the book. And one time, several years ago, as we were working together on a project that relied heavily on community building, Myron brought up one of his favorite books, Community, The Structure of Belonging by Peter Block. I was intrigued by the title. Could a feeling belonging rest on a structure? Could we architect a community? And if so, how? And so I delved in the book and guess what? It immediately became one of my all time favorite reads as well. My copy of Community is all dog eared, underlined, highlighted, full of scribbles in the margins and so on. I went back to it many times as I wrote Dare to Unlead and not just for chapter 11, which deals with community engagement. Peter Block helped me understand many things about leadership, the ideology it conveys, its connection to fear, fault, and impotence, the continuum between the corporate world and society at large, and more. And I went on to read several of Peter's other books and love them too. But community still holds a special place in my heart. And so after I dared to write and ask him to be my guest for this episode, I couldn't believe my luck when Peter said yes. Woohoo! <laughs> Peter Vlock is, um, is an author and a citizen of Cincinnati, Ohio. He is partner in Design Learning, a training company that offers workshops designed to build the skills outlined in his books. His books include Flawless Consulting, which fourth and augmented edition has just been released, Stewardship, the answer to how is yes, community, the abundant community and another kingdom. Peter is uh, a founder of the Common Good Collective and is part of the Cincinnati Common Good Alliance. His work is in the restoration of the common good and creating a world that reclaims our humanity from the onslaught of modernism. Thank you so much, Peter, for generously accepting my invitation. I am thrilled to be in conversation with you today and to invite our listeners to join us. Welcome. Thank you, Celine. Thank you for naming your book to unlead. <laughs> I, I agree, we're, we're suffering from a terminal illness, <clears throat> which Don't. is called the leadership. So thank you for inviting me and happy to say yes. Happy to be oh, here. Awesome. Peter, uh, I'll start with the first question I ask all my guests. What is your art? Can you describe your the professional practice you do in, in your unique way or that is unique to you and what led you to it? Uh, it's a hard question. And the older you get, the harder it is to answer and the more urgent it is to answer. Because uh, if you value your time, then you decide, what am I good at? And, and why don't I pay attention there? and let go of all the things I'm interested in. And so it's a great question. You know, for me, I, it turns out, I, I think I have a gift of translation. I can take ideas that originated in unlikely places, like philosophy or poetry, 
or psychology or gestalt therapy or the inner game of tennis or existential philosophy. And I can bring them into the world of, into the marketplace. And so I think I, <clears throat> I discovered I can do that in person. And I discovered a second half of life in writing. Uh, I also think one of my skills, <coughs> excuse me, is that I'm not angry at the people I'm there to serve. I don't show up. And when I do get angry, which I do often, and I also always know when I'm angry because <clears throat> I make my point for the third time. Okay. Then I leave the room. I go and I get a drink of water, excuse me. Even though I'm not angry right now. <laughs> and so I think no matter what people do, who they are, uh, it's never useful to judge them. It's never useful to have something in mind for them. And our aggression takes very subtle forms, such as advice, recommendations, Questions that have an action step implied in them, such as, uh, what do you plan to do when you get out of school? Okay, when are you going to give me a grandchild? You know, when are you going to move ahead? And so all of those are forms of aggression outward. And there's aggression inward too, which is self-improvement. And so all of us have ideas of what more we should or might be. <clears throat> to me, those are the forms of leadership that you're arguing against. You're arguing against in your wonderful book, Role Models. All right. And uh, so that's a long answer to a question you did not ask, but you're welcome. <laughs> I love it. And as we're talking about community, among other topics, uh, and belonging, how would you define those terms? You know, their words are useful for their ambiguity. And it's the struggle to understand how to customize the term and make it ours that's useful. And so community means everything especially when it becomes popular, it's almost lost its utility. And I've, I've been uh, connected to words that once they became popular, I had to abandon them. Empowerment. I wrote a book on empowerment, but I, when I wrote it, it was an unacceptable term. It was too... Mm. And so community to me is, is, a, is, a, is the experience of honoring our connectedness our collective nature. I don't exist without you and without us. And we don't have much of a language for it. We have very sophisticated language for the individual, for the individualism. And the church went towards the individual, my relationship with God, my relationship with you. And psychology, Freud was radical in 1900 when he, he felt what he, his innovation wasn't his theory. It was that he thought an individual was worth that much attention. Until he came along, we didn't believe that it was worth spending that much time on a person. So that was, but then that's all we have now. We don't have a language for collective, communal. You know, we have funny terms, at least in the U.S., and we're the most individualistic culture I've ever been in. I didn't know that till I left it and went around the world and I realized that people in the U.S. are the slowest learners <clears throat> because we're deeply individualistic and we're very ex exceptional, we think. And so community is, the, is, a, is a language and an experience of the fact that uh, we're in this together like it or not. And belonging 
means that there is a place where I can be myself, <clears throat> even if I never find it. It's a difficult promise. But I may never find that place that's my own. But I belonging means that it's it's there and I get glimpses of it from time. And it's very, very achievable. My own experience is how long does it take to fall in love? 15 minutes if you get the question right. I don't mean romantic love. I mean mm -hmm. the fact that I can be who I am with you. And, and that's what individualism does not trust. Yeah, that's fascinating. A, a community can be stuck. Um, what does it mean? What What is a stuck community? It, it's, a, it's a community that's uneasy with strangers. Mm -hmm. The purpose of a community is to welcome strangers. Hospice, hospitality in traditional times a stranger knocks on your door, it could be your worst enemy, and you say, come in. Can I feed you? Would you like to spend the night? And then when they leave your house the next day, you can plot their demise. But you welcome them. And in the modern world, the individualism world, the leadership world you talk about, we're afraid of the stranger. There's nothing unkinder to productivity, democracy, all right, then like-mindedness. Save me from like-mindedness because I'll never be surprised. Like-mindedness is the longing for certainty, for predictability. And I, every time, I mean, when I do work in the world, when I used to show up, The first thing I would do is break people into small groups with people they knew the least. Because I knew that was the only condition under which they would get what they came for. If they stay with people they're familiar with, they'll never be surprised. And they'll leave exactly the way they came. And what was the point? What's the point of being together if my life isn't changed? What's the point of a vodcast or a podcast if somehow something doesn't happen between you and I, Selene, hmm. that I never thought would possible? In, in some ways, uh, our task is to be surprised, even though you have a set of questions. <laughs> I'm over prepared, as you know. <laughs> But I've been um, I've been longing so much for the opportunity to ask all these questions, and I have probably a million more in, in my head. Um, but one more, um, maybe a, about the, the stuck communities and uh, leaders and leadership and uh, the negative aspects of it. Why do, do we crave for strong leaders? Why do they appeal to us so much, Peter? Why do I crave? Mm -hmm. I think it's an escape from the anxiety of freedom. Mm. To wish not to be accountable, <clears throat> to be born gave me an invoice that I'm afraid I'll never repay. That's why I cry. Every baby cries. They, why don't they laugh when they come out of the womb? You'd think they'd be relieved to last, but they don't. They cry and they their first breath. Is a, is a, and so I just think it's an escape from freedom, escape from choice, escape from anxiety. It's the, it's the uh, belief that uh, I can only be happy or satisfied, surrounded by things that are familiar, predictable, certain. 
That's why to unlead is to say, as a leader, I'm not here to meet your expectation. You're not the kind of leader I had in mind. And your response to that is, I know. I'm not your mother. I'm not your father. Okay. And we've designed human resources, designed leadership as good parenting. That's what you're trying to unwind in, the, in what you're giving your life to. Is, is, is the parenting, is the refusal to be accountable. How can I create a future I want to inhabit if I'm waiting for someone else to hand it to me? And that's why we need each other. That's why what you're advocating is to look horizontally for who I want to be with, not up or down. And uh, when people complain and say, oh, I have a lousy leader. My response is, well, why are you creating that person in that way? And I believe that. I believe that the listener creates the podcast. It doesn't matter what you and I say. We're giving the listeners an excuse while driving, okay, uh, to think about what matters to them. And, and if, if, if we're successful, they'll tune out for a good part of this podcast and have their own thoughts. Oh, I missed that. No, you, you didn't miss anything. We showed up. Celine exists in this world. So you can have your own thoughts. And if you remember what she said or what Peter said, well, you, you'll get over it. And, and, and I believe that. I've raised a whole bunch of children. I didn't raise them. You know, Children raise the parent. Students create inmates run the prison. Listeners create them. One should believe that. Is it true? I don't know. But it's useful. It takes me somewhere. What you're doing in your work is you want to be a participant in people moving somewhere. But somewhere that they have in mind and they need you. We need each other to have the courage to step into an unpredictable world. That's real leadership. Everything else is management. And uh, that's why I love your title, Unlead, Stop Leading. You're not here to meet their expectation. You're here to, to be a, a stance for the larger purpose. It's not anything goes. We somebody gave us a dollar or a franc or a euro, uh, and we got to deliver on what they gave it to us for. Now, how we do that? There's a thousand ways. May not be a popular message to sell to executives in the corporate I world today. I think they're waiting for it. Hmm. There are no more restrained imprisoned people than senior executive. Mm. Nobody learns more slowly than people at the top. So if you do a two-day workshop for people in the middle, you need a three-day workshop for senior executive because they're so programmed. They don't even write their own talks. I don't know about in France, but in the US, if you do a town hall meeting, you have PowerPoints and a rehearsed speech. And if you ask for questions, they are filtered by a communication specialist. I once gave a talk at AT&T and they kept passing in little cards for questions. And I said, what are the questions you didn't ask me after it was over? He said, well, we got two or three that said, where the hell did you get this person? Okay, so they were screening out questions that they didn't want to ask. And, and so uh, that's why the, the executive is in prison. They're caught between the investor, the board who cares less about what they are and who that they're doing, and the employees and the customer. And so what you're doing is liberating top management. Now, 
we have to be with them and, and with love and support. But I, I have zero expectations that top management will play any real role other than reclaiming their own humanity, reclaiming their own selves. And then they're learning how to unlead. They're learning how to affirm that. And uh, oh, what do you think about what I just said, Sue? I love thought? every word. I love every word of it. Um, really? And I, I, I wonder what's. Um, I mean, it opens up possibilities. So many possibilities. Now, well, would it, will will people be brave enough to? Well, what catch bravery them? is required of you and I? Where does it lead us? Maybe stepping into the discomfort of working with people who do not share these ideas necessarily. And um, I know, for example, I'm reluctant. I'm quite resistant in you know going and in, into some circles where I feel my ideas are not necessarily welcome. Or they 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 looked uh, with suspicion, and I know I should make this effort with love, as you said, with openness, without judgment, and it's hard. It is hard. Hmm. It's hard because why does it why is it hard? You think because you you have the will and the strength hmm. to do anything. You've proven that, or you wouldn't have written a book with that title. Hmm. So why is it hard? It's hard for, well, I'm alone. I'm an individual. I'm just a, a one person. And they are, you know, part of the power structure and the, you know, all these, these, yeah, powerful people. And um, so many reasons. Um, well, this, that's, that's a construct you're expressing. Mm. I'm asking you mm. because you're speaking for all of us. Mm. Okay. Uh, but it's that what you just said is something we've constructed because they are feeling every bit as alone with each other as I am with them. And part of our, I had to get used to being in a room with people that were mad at me for the stance I was taking. And it wasn't speechy, it was just what I break them into small groups. I started by running sensitivity training back decades, lifetimes ago. And we asked all people the content of this five days we're spending together is what happens in this circle. And so what you learn, how you move this forward is up to you. Silence, eye contact. They were really angry. What? 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 And they would yell at me. This is you, punk. You? I can remember being up against the wall and they're all standing up, expressing their deep disappointment that their company has wasted money. And I work for the company. What do I do with that? It, it, it activated every doubt I'd had from my first cry, okay? I knew what I was getting into and I was, I was right. And so at some point you realize that their response has nothing to do with you, nothing to do with me. And all, they're waiting for us to come in the room, tell them there's choices, the things they thought they believed in. And, uh, and accept them for, and basically the message we bring as leaders, partners, community members, is what we thought was true, we made up. So if that's so, once I get over the disappointment, then I'm free to construct an alternative story, alternative narrative. So what we're doing in the world is inviting people to create an alternative narrative that they want to live into. Is it true? 
I don't know, but it might be useful. I don't want to argue about anything. I want to, and, uh, that's why they, I made a living. People say, why did you work for corporations? Well, for the same reason that Willie Sutton in the U.S. robbed banks. You know why? Because that's where the money was. <laughs> okay. I wanted to make a living. And so I went where I could make a living. And Exxon paid me a salary. And so there we are. And then within that world, we're looking for people looking for us. Yeah, I agree. I don't want to be in a room with people that were forced to listen to me. I want to be in the room, but I just assume if they are in the room, they chose to be there. Because people know how to get out of anything. Everybody's dog hates their homework. <laughs> it's not my fault. Everybody's children had a birthday today. Everybody's family members are in the hospital. Everybody, traffic was horrible. All right, people don't want to be there. So the fact they're in the room, I take that as an invitation. Now, how we show up with them, we can't decide that there's something wrong with them. Otherwise, we don't belong there. There's nothing wrong with them. And, uh... you, you mentioned the word invitation several times. Why do you say leadership is convening? Some would say leadership is about decision making or mm -hmm. envisioning the future or whatever other words, but you say it's convening. What does it mean? It means that if I care about outcomes, I care about performance. I care about delivering the promise I made to get that euro in my pocket, in our pocket. It will only come from people's relationship with each other. That <laughs> workers with each other is what's essential to all outcomes. I mean, I, I used to work with a utility company and uh, they loved storms. They loved it when the lines were down. I said, why do you love that so much? He says, because hierarchy doesn't matter. I don't care whether you're the boss or the president. If I tell you to pick up that line or hold that, you do it. And, and then that's when the real peer relationships deliver the future. That's why leaders need to confront and engage peers with each other. It's not simple because I'm used to competing with my peers. All right, first grade, I don't know about in France, but in the US, first grade, they're no longer my friends, they're my competition. If I wanted an A or a B, somebody had to get, get a D or an F by design. Hmm. And if the teacher had a high performing class, the teacher was in trouble. The boss hmm. is in trouble, you know? And so that's why to convene is to engage people create the word community, belonging, connection, relation, peers with each other. And that, that's the most powerful thing I can do. That's the most powerful way I can use the leverage and power that I have. I don't know. Make any sense? It does. But when you lead a company of 100,000 people, how do you convene all these people? Well, it's too you, big. You don't. It, it's always the world. It's always so you, you, you convene within reach. And you decide how you want to show up whatever room you're in. And if you're on a town meeting at a water cooler session with 40,000 people, luckily they won't all show up. But even if it's virtual, you break them into small groups. Nobody can touch 100,000 people. Or, or five billion people. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea that the buck stops here is a joke. The buck doesn't even get to you at the top. Now, you have a job to do. You have promises to fulfill, but 
every time you're in a room, you say, how do I engage these people to be accountable to each other? Not accountable to me. Failure is always an option. And stop all this masculinizing. Adolescent. Chit-chat. You speak about the small group. I remember my my surprise when I read in, probably in community that the small group was the unit of transformation because I was uh, having big hopes on large scale change. So how do you move from small group to systems change? Exactly. Margaret Mead, that's her quote. Uh, Fidel Castro had 93 people to start his revolution. He said all he needed was 11. He was overstaffed by 80. Okay. Systems thinking is powerful. Systems change is an illusion. You, you don't have an impact by doing things at scale. Scale is a defense against transformation. All right, because as soon as you take something to scale, you're doing the same thing over and over and over again, which means nobody has to imagine or create anything. Now, if you want large system change, then you find you confront, engage people in, in rethinking what they are up to, and then you aggregate that and let them find out what other people are doing. You don't set up a program. You don't set up a competency model. This happened in the 80s in the U.S. when cars were, superior cars were coming from Japan. And there was a 10, 15 year period when, when employee involvement was taken seriously. When we thought we needed our employees and we broke them into small groups. They were called quality circles. And, and the fact that Ford, I worked with Ford Motor Company. And it was interesting, the, the, uh, it was hard times. And so the top managers were brought together and they said, well, you gotta get rid of 25,000 people. And they did. And then they called the president in and they said, we don't ever wanna do this again. He said, well, why are you telling me? He says, cause the way you're running this company, the way we're running, it's not working. And they started employee involvement, quality circle movement that turned that company around. And it, it was, they aggregated, but every group had the assignment of figuring out what can we do to make this thing work better. And they were paid to do that. And, uh, and so that's, I have, to, I have to think about the nature of our interdependence but I don't want to act on that. I don't want my strategy. Put the blueprint down. I need a blueprint for how you and I are going to spend this hour together. Anything more than that's an illusion. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's manipulation. It's marketing. Don't have a PowerPoint deck and, and let it cascade down like warm water from the Hawaiian waterfall. Okay, stop that. You know, that, you know that, if you just can entertain that thought, then it takes you somewhere. Well, aren't there certain things we need to be consistent about? Yeah, we need, we're making a promise to the world and that every time people come to your podcast, I mean, they, they need to know that they're gonna be made uncomfortable. Okay, and be cared for. And uh, they'll have a chance to think for themselves. So you, you gotta make sure everybody has that, but how you do that, you're, you're gonna make up every time. You don't know who you're dealing with. And that's, the, that's life. I once had a manager who gathered his, his team of which I was a member of and who said to us, what I need from you is order and discipline. And I didn't say anything. I just looked at people and, and saw a few of them nodding and said, yes, yes, sir. You know, 
we, we, we need order and discipline for sure. Should I have said anything? Should I have, you know? Yes. You, you mm. might have inquired mm. and said, what the, why is that important to you? What are you concerned about? What do you see in us that would lead you to make that request? Thank you. I'll think about it. He said, well, can I count on you, Celine, for order and discipline? I, uh, and I, I would say, I need to understand what that means for us. So I, it's not a commitment I can make to you right now. But we have the same, we're here for the same reason. And, and the fact that you're concerned, I trust what you see. And then let's keep talking about how we do something about what you're concerned about. Because your concerns matter to me. What an elegant response. I wish I, I had, I, I, like, elegant and clever. I, I wish I had me thought too. about that. Mm. I have 20 <laughs> instances which I wish I'd thought of. I can only say it now, but nothing's <laughs> on the line. <laughs> uh, it's hard to be a change agent from the inside because you you have you have all this performance management system all those processes all this this control mechanisms and, and in, you internalize control as well it's not easy yes we have internalized it and the word change agent mm. is a little uh, presumptuous so does that mean i have something in mind for you well then you've never raised a child if you think what you had in mind for that child had anything to do with who they are, look again. Okay. Thank God. That proves to me the existence of God is that the children did not turn out in ways that I had in mind. And, uh, and they have forgiven me for all of my guidance and molding behavior. Mostly. Not exactly. And so I, I think the change agent is our participation in patriarchy, that language, change management. I would never call myself a change agent. I may be a stance for a world that I believe in. I'm happy to be an activist. And the book I just finished writing is about relational activism. But activism is now thought of as people in anger wanting, waiting for someone else's transformation. You really are waiting for the president of France's transformation. Really? Give the guy a break. He took the job. I don't want it. You know? So what? And why treat him as if he's important? He's not, he, he's not worthy of being the headline in the news every day. So part of the, but anyway, so, you know, you're, you're a stance, you're an advocate, you are a possibility that enters the room every time you show up. But the idea that I'm a change agent, no, I'm a, I'm a participant in creating an alternative world. I want to imagine what this company could become. And I, I want to join in wondering what customers, what, you know, all the things we stand for, whether it's a government or a school. But we, we run them in ways that are hostile to our intentions. So that's what you've been confronting all your life, is, is confronting people with whether what they're doing is aligned with what their intentions are. If you say, what's, what's, why, what was I trying to do consulting or what am I trying to do in this moment? It has to be a stance or an expression of people living out their own intentions. I trust my faith. I'm not optimistic, but my faith is that people, given a little bit of breathing space, will live out their intentions and their intentions will serve us all. And sometimes they won't. And that acknowledges the existence of evil. So there's evil in the world. I got it. So what do you do with evil? You see it for, you call it evil. And then figure out how do we create an alternative? How is this going, Celine? Mm. 
it's going on great and it makes me think that it's um, somehow comfortable to have someone to blame right mm -hmm. so be it the president the ceo the manager etc it's also a comfortable position right short term it's like mm -hmm. an, an addict finds short-term comfort mm. and long-term pain so it's it's a in the short term, it gets me out of the moment to have someone else to blame, but it leaves me feeling helpless. Mm -hmm. And that feeling of helplessness is not good for my mental health. It's not good for my well being. So, in your terms, to if you say, Why well, you want me to unlead, what do you want me to pro lead? Well, it's confronting people with their helplessness, giving them an alternative to their helplessness. Because ultimately, it leads to violence. And what about relational activism? Exactly. The, the, this book you're writing about? I'm trying to integrate uh, what we know about small groups, relation, and community with concerns, common good that we have in mind. And we come together on our concerns. I mean, you know, we all care about raising a child. We all care about being safe. Okay, Paris has a mayor who, who thought of a 15 minute city, which means that whatever you need, you can get by walk, a 15 minute walk, which means it's a world within reach. And we agree on that. We care about our health. We care about you know, ending isolation. We care about the aesthetic. So why not use our group methods to solve those problems instead of the traditional dominant business perspective? And so, but let activism be a form of connecting, not a form of demanding. Let activism be where you and I decide we can create a world together and we don't have to wait for anybody else that we can, we can do whatever we can to create an hour that matters together. Now, it's all we got. And then pray that somebody will know what to do with this silliness, you know? And so the relational is, is trying to change the nature of activism and make it uh, affectionate. And, and when we, people come together as activists, okay, to protest, protest the government, you guys have been upset about having to work a year longer, okay? okay. And uh, you have everything going for you, and yet you don't want to work a year longer. And God bless you for that, okay? And, but you're waiting for who to decide that? Okay, and so why don't we, when people gather, why don't we break them into small groups? Why don't we say, thank you for coming. I know you're here because you want the government to back off on the economic necessity, okay, of extending blah, blah, blah. Would you break into groups, of small groups, and, and say, well, what, what are you doing to contribute to the problem that this thing was supposed to solve? What are you doing? What are we doing? Say, what doubts do we have that anything will make a difference? All right. What for, what's forgiveness is required of us at this moment? What gifts do we have that come to bear to solve the problem this thing was supposed to? These, this is relational activism. And, and why these people? Because they showed up. And why don't we make that the uh, form of of, um, you know, protest, gospel. The gospel is a term for the news. Why don't we construct the news ourselves? That's the dream. That's my... Luckily, I'm not burdened by being reasonable or practical. <laughs> Peter, this is... a. Uh... This is an amazing conversation. I could go on for hours, but um, I need to respect your time. Is there one more question I 
did not ask and I should ask or you you're you like to answer any one additional question I, not, you know they all come to mind and we we uh, I just appreciate doing this with you that's that's the point is that there's a space in this world for you and I to have this conversation and you're still doing something about it all right you're out there you still have a, a world and and you're powerful because you're one of the people that you're speaking to there's not in you an ounce of arrogance or righteousness there's a lot of pain and frustration i get that or you wouldn't write a book nobody writes a good book because they're feeling good okay you, you write a book because you're tired of talking to a therapist and you say well let me write this crap down and get it out of my system and the fact that somebody published it well that's but anyway i just i i am so grateful to be able to support who you are and what you're doing in the world that's the point thank you peter that was a wonderful conversation i yes, am so so grateful Yes, Thank so you so much. People will find welcome. all links and references in the speaker's notes. And um, that was a wonderful gift again. So, so merci beaucoup, Peter. Thank you. You're welcome. Great insights. Thank you all for listening. You'll find more info in Dare to Unlead, the book, and all links in the podcast episode description. And now, what else? Action. To explore further and apply these ideas to your own context, reach out to me at weneedsocial.com. Let's unlead together.